Greetings and welcome to a bitey and scratchy episode of Genre Grinder. I hope you had your rabies shots. I'm your host, Gabe, and with me today is returning guest, Ariani Pilarte. Say hello, my friend. Hello. Thank you for having me back. <laughs> Yeah, it's been more than a year. I realized I I I, I didn't really. I, I feel Has like I want to really? talk to. Yeah, it was like it was like a December I, that we last did it, and oh of like my. over a year ago. So yeah. Oh, time is time is a thief. That's a good way of putting it. It's very poetic. So today we're looking at killer animal movies, which is something I had already planned on eventually covering, um, but Ariani brought it up to me uh, when I asked her what she wanted to talk about. Um, unfortunately for her, she let me pick the movies, so <laughs> she may never want to talk about killer animal movies again after this, but that's the way the cookie crumbles if you let me choose. Uh, <laughs> I actually find them very fun and poetic. I mean, the movies you picked were, were very, uh, very fun, I will say. Okay, um, well, good. I, 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 ha- <laughs> I haven't had a chance to do like my jokey letterboxed reviews yet of them, but <laughs> I will. <laughs> okay. So killer animals is the easiest way to describe this, um, but I've heard them called eco horror, uh, which is is sort of a broader genre that I think should include natural disaster movies and like there's a lot of global warming or climate change horror movies uh, that that have popped up the last ten fifteen years about like horrible prehistoric monstrosities that come out of melting ice. Uh, those are those are kind of their own thing, and maybe someday I'll do global warming horror, but. Um, but my favorite things that people I've seen called in books and stuff that are talking about movie genres is nature run on muck or creature on the loose movies. I prefer those, but I think killer animal movies is, is a better title for SEO purposes uh, uh, for people to find uh, what we're talking about here. Yeah. And everybody knows like the big ones like Jaws and yeah. Birds, which is why like I was watching the birds because you gave me you were like oh, I want you back on. Think of something we can talk about. And that always like stresses me out. It gives me like, <laughs> I'm like, oh, I was like, what? What could I, po- what hyper specific genre could I possibly talk about? And then we were watching the birds and I was like, oh, this is a hyper specific genre. So yeah. Yeah. I mean, I figure the birds and Jaws are the two killer animal movies that almost everyone between the ages of 15 and elderly has seen yeah. at some point or is at least aware of if we're going to talk about like the golden age of killer animal movies because they've been around forever and i didn't need to like research the first killer animal movie because i'm sure there was a, a black and white one or I'm, I'm sorry a silent one at some point but i feel like after jaws was a hit there was a brief period in the 70s where there was like the golden era of killer animal movies and they they were like every drive-in in the world had like a double feature of killer animal movies but I, I should have maybe picked from that cult golden era, but I ended up uh, just choosing movies I liked. And uh, without realizing it, they're almost all from a like 12 year period after that golden era, like the late 70s and mid mid to late 80s is is where everything and I didn't do it on purpose, but it sort of ended up having a sort of theme to it of, of increasing ridiculousness. And oh, like, oh, did they? Once you're like, once you've got like Grizzly out of the way, once you got that out of your system and you have to look for something else to do, then then you come up with stuff like this is I think that that might be what appeals to me about these these four movies we're going to talk about. And you're right. They definitely like increase in like the kind of. <laughs> and that was an accident that that's just because I wanted to watch them in order and in, in, in release order like usual. And it, it's not technically release order. I'll talk about that later. I flipped two of them. But they were the same year. They were just months apart. I, I, the other thing I thought of is, is I think that I lose interest in it sometime around when it becomes a sort of dumping ground for uh, made-for-TV and straight-to-DVD movies. Right. And there's something about these jokey CG-heavy movies. Oh, that like, just, just, like the try-hard just, ones, like Sharknado yeah. and all that. Yeah, that's just sort of tedious to me. And then where the, these earlier movies are are trying to be serious, which sometimes makes them hilarious but at this you know i don't know they just are more they have they're not as creatively bankrupt i guess no and and they're they're genuine like you can tell like you know i mean obviously they're limited in what they can and can't do and some of them really are pushing the limits and like i'm like wow you guys are really doing a lot with these animals in mm-hmm. this movie but um they're they're definitely trying to do something yeah. and yeah, at least and, that's what makes them entertaining like and none like, of them cost very much either no. we're not talking like jurassic park level like 
budgets here. <laughs> no, <laughs> right, because guess... the animals are freaking real, and it's just like like one of the, I was telling you earlier, like one of these movies really upset me because I was like, yeah. this is a lot of animals, a lot of really actually dangerous animals on this set. Yeah, actually, that's something I should say is there's basically a content warning for all the movies we're going to cover here, and that uh, uh, most of them didn't hurt animals. There's one exception, obviously, but what? they really? all in they all involve Wait, violence. One of them. One of them actually, like, one of the animals actually got hurt? I'm pretty sure in the movie you were talking about, there are some injured animals in that film. Oh. I'm pretty sure. We'll talk about, that's the third one. Okay, yeah. I do have a question about something that happens in that movie. Yeah, there's a couple things in that movie that I'm just like, eh. But for the most part, they're faking it or they're finding things like, like, like footage of already dead animals and stuff. It happens a lot. Um, But so even if, even if there was aspca on set or something like there's still if you don't like watching animals get hurt i don't think any of these are particularly good option <laughs> maybe no, they're all pretty... maybe yeah, yeah they're all kind of depressing when it comes to that but anyway we're gonna start with the the real movie of the bunch quote unquote which is a uh, long weekend from 1978 but it was a uh, shot in 77 it's directed by colin eggleston and uh, he, uh, for directing such a classy movie, he was coming off his debut uh, for a, a softcore porn sequel called Phantasma Comes Again. Nice. Uh, so he was not known for making great movies, but I, he made a pretty serious minded film here. And it was written by a guy named Everett DeRoche, um, who claims that he was he was writing very popular TV shows and he was cla- he claimed he was sick of writing cop shows and he wanted to just write something off the top of his dome with no research or cop shit and so he just sort of came up with this story and the the very basic version is it's it's about a couple who's feuding who goes on a very ill-advised trip out into the uh not necessarily into like the depths of the outback they go to the um the the coast like it's still sort of a vacation area area it's not like they're disappearing into the center of australia or anything like that but uh, but you know, work. being that is Australia, <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> the Nothing animals is... there are built different, to say the least. Yes, yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's, this is uh, this uh, is what we call. Oh, oh, quickly, I should say, this is not to be confused with the 2021 romantic comedy, or the 2005 Canadian comedy, or the 1989 indie <laughs> drama, or the remake with Jim Caviezel, which is uh, by the There's director a of Urban Legend. Yeah, it's very bad. It was from 2008. Nobody up. liked it. It I was from the Urban Legend and Va- yeah, Urban Legend and Valentine guy did it. Who you know, those are pretty decent slasher movies from the you know late late 90s. Um, but he yeah, he just it just was it didn't work out. And Jim Caviezel, you don't want to give that guy your yeah. money. But yeah, so so because this is an Australian film from the golden age of Australian cinema, they, uh, it counts as an Oz exploitation film. So any of those documentaries, there's the not quite Hollywood documentary and any books and any sort of information. There was a period there maybe 10 years ago where Oz exploitation was where it was at. Uh, and this is the less exploitation y side of that spectrum because it, it's more eerie and low key. It's not like a bunch of nudity and, and violence and curse words and wacky. I mean, people. there's some nudity. There's a, a touch. Little. It's not, it's that. not um, Phantasma <laughs> Comes Again level of nudity. No. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, as, as you said, and as one might expect, coming from the island nation that's covered in venomous creatures and man-eating creatures and otherwise deadly creatures, um, a lot of Australian horror movies are about killer animals in one way or another, good ones and bad ones. And actually, we're covering two here. The second one we're also going to be is also Australian. And then, so the other thing that happens a lot if you watch enough of these Aussie horror movies is that they sort of take something from Deliverance and Texas Chainsaw Massacre where if you go too far away from the city, the country's just full of homicidal maniacs that are just sweaty and gross. <laughs> this one doesn't have much of that, though. That's going to come up no. a lot more in the next movie. <laughs> but uh, there's this sort of fear of the boonies that I feel like Australian movies and American movies have in common is just fear of the boonies and what's going to happen out there. And I know other I countries have I think that it's problem, like the but... Outback. The Outback is where is It's huge. It's like if you look at a map where all the people live on the edges and there's just this space and it's yeah. just full of it's the like unknown. It's like nothing out there. 
that's that's why all the Mad Max movies work because you could drive and like like the Mad Max movies, there could be civilization in the peripheries and you'd never know it because it's True. huge. But and this is one I was just saying that the, you know these aren't necessarily all eco horror, but this one counts as eco horror I think because it it's pretty explicitly about there's a subtext and a text and the text is about people carelessly abusing the environment and the environment fighting back and the carelessness is key because they're not necessarily malevolent these it's not like they're not like uh captain planet villains trying to burn down the rainforest they're just careless especially the dude and he's careless in in many many ways like towards his girlfriend and are are they they married i think that they're um married because she says at one point she talks about she actually uses the word divorce so they are oh, a married okay couple. yeah and, and the movie opens with we know something's wrong between them and they shouldn't be going on this trip but they don't tell us um he implies that she's cheated at the beginning but um that's not what what the actual argument is about i don't know if the filmmakers were necessarily trying to paint him as bad as he is, or if that's just sort of like them showing their bias that they think the two of them are just as bad as each other, but watching it with, you know, modern eyes, it, this, this woman stuck in this, this situation with this man who just will not accept that she's not having fun (laughs) doing what he wants to do. (laughs) They also kind of paint her in this way because like the whole thing, because she hates his dog. (laughs) <laughs> yeah kind of like, yeah she's exactly she's she mean to the, the dog, dog. <laughs> she's mean to the dog and she's just and she's bad just, yeah exactly they try to pull that off towards the end of the movie when when they're leaving she's like oh but she doesn't care about the dog so she's just as bad and it's like yeah but he was he was being a shit the entire film so i don't know if those yeah. are exactly even I don't think of the guy in this movie as a misogynist. He's just an asshole. He's just, no. he's, he's a boy. He, there's all this stuff where he's bought all this really expensive camping equipment. He's never gone camping before. None of the, he there's a funny. to ask for directions. He gets lost. Yeah. I'm like, oh my God. like, all right. Yeah. He's like, um, he's just, he's just a child. Like, I, I don't remember what they say he does for a job, but they do have money. I remember he does something that makes the money so he can afford to do this, but it's just, it's it's not he's just not reading the room he's just making her go along on this trip and so she's pissed off the whole time and and sniping at him he keeps trying to like if i'm just sweet it will change the the mood and it's like no we've gone too far you can't just uh flirt your way out of this one pal some of the things that they do uh that pisses off nature and again this is more like they're being haunted by nature than being attacked by nature is the kind of way to put it like the movie starts and his car scares some pigeons and he litters and his cigarette causes a small fire. Yeah. He, the fire. He hits a kangaroo and doesn't make a big deal out of it. Uh, apparently this is so common in Australia that the camera crew didn't even have to make a fake kangaroo. They just walked down the road and found a dead kangaroo to film what? after the fact. Yeah. They like faked oh. the running over part. And then the part where you see the dead ra- kangaroo, there's just, it's like, it's like raccoons out here in the Midwest. They're just, a Stop. Million of them. they're like yeah. pests basically. They're like deer from what I understand. Oh. They're like, they're like white tailed deer out here or, or no mule deer. I can't remember what kind of deer we have out here, but they're like deer out here where they're just big animals that there's a lot yeah. of. And, and most people think they're cute, but they can be pests. Yeah, they're, no, should. they'll fight you. Like, I've seen yeah, video of, like, kangaroos, like, like squaring yeah. up with people, like Mike Tyson. I'm like, bro, yeah. why? why are they so jacked? <laughs> they got, That's crazy. They got claws, too. They have claws? Um, yeah, they got pretty big claws. They dig. <laughs> That's so cool and so scary. Yeah. The th- first thing the guy does that makes him just really look like a childish asshole, childish asshole is he's chopping down a tree. And she says, "Why are you? Why are you doing that?" And he just says, "Why not?" He's just he didn't bored. chop it for fire. Um, he have I, I yeah. She says we have firewood or something like that. And she says, "Why are you doing that?" And he just says, "Why not?" This movie is kind of sets you up to like if you saw a little kid doing that, you probably wouldn't care. But now you're like, "Uh oh, don't do that." Well, that's the, the, the thing. It's like, like you're a grown person. Like why? Why yeah. you, like do all this? Stuff? She's spraying an insecticide on everything. Um, yeah. Eventually, oh, all they, right. All the bugs. Oh, and she yeah. steals the egg. Yeah, and she steals an egg. Um, he just shoots the water for fun with his crappy. What a heavy metaphor food. that is. <laughs> well, and then and then and then he shoots a dugong, thinking it's a shark. I had and no idea what that animal was. I only know the a new dugong name. is basically <laughs> a manatee. 
It's basically a manatee. You go from Pokemon. There's a Pokemon named Dugong, and it looks like a seal. And I was like, "Oh, that's the name." Yeah, no, no, they're 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 like they're basically a manatee from the other side of the world. They they have slightly okay. different faces, um, but they're kind of the same creature. There's so and, many animals I've never heard of. Well, and then so so in case you're like watching the movie, and then we're gonna spoil. I think all four of these movies. Um, they're old yeah, enough. Yeah, we movies, might as well. I'm not gonna feel bad about spoiling them like I do sometimes, but. The, you spend the movie like, what happened? Was there cheating involved? Like they mentioned hotels, and then she she steals a, a eagle's egg for no reason and smashes it, and he kills a duck mother, leaving ducklings alone. And then after he kills the dugong, we can hear the dugong's baby crying out, mm. and it's like, ah, this is an abortion metaphor. Yeah. <laughs> but didn't didn't she smash the egg to save him? Like, wasn't there a bird attacking and she took the No, egg she ca- she smashes the egg in, in an argument and then the bird oh. attacks him and actually fucks oh. him up and he kind of laughs about it. That's one of the most endearing thing he does is every time he gets hurt, he sort of giggles about it because he does. <laughs> he's like, he's it's like, not a big deal. I'm fine, I'm fine. Yeah. It's like that um that gif for, of um uh Julie Louise Dreyfus saying what the fuck as well smiling. <laughs> it's basically that's him every time something yeah. happens. What the fuck is happening? <laughs> I think because he um, still wants to try and have a good time because she wants to yeah. leave so badly and he's like, I yeah. don't want to leave. He's like, This is fine. It's not a big deal. Like, the way like men can't admit that something's wrong and that they're yeah. wrong. And that he's this just was like, a very bad idea. Yes, it's and, like the dog on fire meme where she's like, This is fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. The thing the movie does really well is is it's it's not subtle about the metaphor, which is something I actually enjoy. I don't know if I've told you this before. One of my favorite things in horror movies is, is horror movies with really heavy handed metaphors that no, also agree. have sort of ironic punishments. Like I love this sort of EC comics mode of horror, which is like what a lot of George Romero movies are. Mm-hmm. Uh, they have this sort of irony to to everything that happens that the if if you know the the ec comics are much shorter so it's like tales from the crypt if you, i'm sure you've seen tales from the crypt before. yeah they always have yeah, these yeah. like you did this thing and now you died it turned out it was you who did the and, and so it, this has got a little of that but it treats it really seriously and, yeah, and like you know it's basically fairy tale yeah and it's almost like um a, i mean there's parts of it that feel like it's the same as like a gothic horror story where instead of going to the you know in a horse buggy to the castle they're taking their crappy Jeep to the shoreline and there's like signs. They're saying, nobody go this way. And, and oh arrows God. pointing. And it like pissed me off. I was like, this like, you can't read like, hello. Yeah. He doesn't, <laughs> that's not for me. Um, <laughs> that speaking of, yeah, that's the Garfield meme. Who's that for? I don't know. Um, <laughs> And, oh, do you remember the joke I made? And you were like, don't spoil it for yourself. Oh. I was just like, did a dingo eat their baby? You're like, no. <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah so so I mean, it's spooky it's heavy-handed but it's spooky and the the difficult balance that the director does is he has to make us afraid for these people but also know that they deserve their fate in a certain way yeah and that's you know that's that's hard to do that's hard to make the audience kind of hate the audience or hate the audience hate the characters but no, also wait. not want them to die so she had an abortion right but right it's the the abortion was not his baby that i'm not clear on because he implies at one point that it was yeah there was uh, she says something about you practically push me towards him so there was cheating but she blames mm-hmm. him for it right and he also makes but at the same time even if it wasn't his child he makes it seem like it's still his sort of right to tell her that she's is she is or isn't allowed to have an abortion Mm. So I feel like it, it doesn't fill in a, everything, which is probably good. We we know we're just getting a slice. This is like a two day period in these people's lives. We don't. Right. Need, I mean, I guess we, like it, it is it is kind of like a more tragic thing because obviously, you know, she had an affair. Yeah. But she also had an abortion without knowing who the father might have been. Yeah. Which is and, kind of like extra kind of like haunting i suppose you know because yeah now they both have that hanging over their heads i don't think that the filmmakers intended it as a pro-choice or pro-life movie they just wanted it to be like this is 
the haunting of of mm-hmm. abortion, which is a common thing in horror stories. Of course, yeah. I, I mean, I like that it it's not it doesn't give like a, a moralistic stance on that. It doesn't right. say anything good or bad about it. It just says this is a reality, and it's obviously like a complicated feeling that mm-hmm. she's going through, and that's genuine, you know. And I, I actually really really like that that aspect of of this movie. And and something that's actually really nice is as even though it is a heavy handed metaphor. I like the idea of sort of connecting a crumbling romantic relationship with this sort of environment, like like the animals and environment going mad. Like even their foods like being attacked by mold. It's not just the animals, but it's like the microorganisms and everything mm-hmm. is sort of, it's almost like the environment's feeding off of them. I, I joked at you when we, when you watched it, that it's, it's right. The, they're, it's taking place right next to the beach from old, but but I, I and they do find that someone else has died on the beach uh, at at one point. So it might be like an actual haunted beach. But there's also this just idea that their toxic city is. I mean, there was an entire everything. sign telling them to keep out. It's like literally yeah. warning you. Yeah, it, it doesn't get clearer than that. I hate when it happens. Like white people love doing that. They just ignore signs in movies, and it's just like ah, this isn't for me. And it's just like it's telling you no and they're like i don't care i've been here before this is fine it's just like you idiots this is what you get so and then the uh i think i said something about this already but there is the the other idea that all this expensive shit they say something about he spent two thousand australian dollars on the equipment which is probably a lot 1977 money Mm. and none of it really works like the cooler doesn't stop the chicken from rotting and the harpoon gun just goes off for no reason oh my um, god the part in like the very beginning where i freaked out i was like why is he pointing that at her yeah yeah well that's and that's sort of i think that that that's a way of them foreshadowing sort of is a literary device etc yeah yeah it's it's <laughs> chekhov's harpoon gun <laughs> <laughs> and I, they never actually give a uh a real explanation for why this is happening on a sci-fi level which is something i appreciate you have to have a really cool explanation for your you know your zombies or whatever I like it better when they don't say it, but they, there are news reports on their TV and their radio throughout talking about some sort of nuclear tests and other things going wrong around us, like the city. No, see, um, I missed really all just, of that because it's all background noise that just sort of makes things feel more eerie. It's yeah. not to the degree that like night of the living dead does it where we get all of our exposition from the television. It's just like this sort of like hint that something worse is going on in the bigger world. Yeah. But it doesn't feel like apocalyptic or anything. No, but, but that's also its own commentary too. Like, oh, there are yeah. nuclear tests and there's uh, consequences for nuclear yeah. testing on the environment as well as yeah. people, you know, and animals. You know, we, animals. we talk, we, we think so much about like, oh, there's these huge consequences if you do nuclear testing on just like people, they get, you know, cancer and radiation exposure and stuff like that. But we don't really think about how that affects you know, yeah. wildlife and water and plant life and stuff like that. We don't take that into consideration because we're so focused on like the human aspect. There are some really disturbing parts. It's not a particularly gory movie, um, but there's a really visceral part where she's just decided to ditch him and she's driving away in the dark and these birds just keep kamikazing the oh, way out of the windshield. Yeah. Which I'm sure is supposed to be like the booth scene, the phone booth scene and the birds. And then later, um, after she's disappeared, one of the birds drops her shoe on him. And it's almost like the bird's like, we got you, gal, mate. <laughs> 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 it's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. And then there, you know, the real ironic twist at the end, there's the way both of them die is particularly. Mm-hmm. Um, apparently, the original cut. Or the original script, he survived, which would have been a terrible idea, I think. Yeah. Especially after she dies, he has to die. Otherwise, you end up with just like, like, is there going to be a big, like, police investigation as to why she's dead? Oh, like, nah, yeah, you just got to kill but, them both. But also, it's you know, it's it's. I think he's the one that comes off the worst yes. in the whole movie versus her. I mean, it depends on, I guess how sympathetic you are because neither one of them are particularly good people or nice people when he tries to hide how to move how to take the car from her like there's a there's an off switch in this jeep oh yeah he won't tell her where it is Mm because that that's just pure abuse on his he never hits her or anything like that you can tell that he's very controlling 
Yeah, you can tell he knows there's a line when it comes to physical abuse. But um, yeah, he's very controlling and he finds ways of putting her in a situation where she doesn't have a choice, basically, throughout the movie. It's very it's a different kind of abuse for sure. Mm -hmm. But I I guess if you want to be if you want to be sympathetic towards him, he's been put in a situation where she cheated. Yeah. You know, not that that's any excuse, you know. Well, yeah. And then she implies she did on sucks. It sounds like the way she said you practically pushed me towards him makes me think that like he thought this was like a wife swap uh, thing and that he had a crush on it. Mm. And that, that's just where my mind went. There's also a very brief moment at the beginning of the movie where he's flirting with a woman on the street that that like. Yeah, that too. Is, I think it's trying to put the idea in our heads that he has cheated. So we'll be thinking about that later. But I, yeah, they yeah. never say anything about that. But I think it's that might just be planted. No, I think it. she's punished more for being a cheater than he mm-hmm is but that's because it's not made explicit that he mm-hmm. also cheated she not only did she cheat she got pregnant yeah and doesn't know how she yeah. got pregnant like it's just like if a woman does that oh yeah oh, exactly so much worse you know versus if he cheats and gets someone else pregnant it's just like well of course i want to say <laughs> i want to say the movie's aware of that but i don't like to subscribe too much you know i don't want to assume too much about uh, older movies especially exploitation movies and their intention towards towards women. uh women or other cultures or anything you know i don't want to assume yeah. I, but but from my point of view i feel like the, the filmmakers had to have some some of that in mind he d- he definitely comes across as a loser at the very least he's just uh-huh. he's not good at anything and he's, he goes out like a loser Yes. He goes out yes. the, he goes out in a way that he deserved. When I saw that, I was like, ooh. Yeah, can you imagine that we just ended get. with him leaving? That would have been that would have been such a letdown. It, it would have been a little unsatisfying, but because like, I think I think because of the way he dies, it's just kind of like it's kind of like oof. They're really <laughs> like they I was like they kind they nailed it. They they yeah. they nailed the point home for sure. Now wait, we didn't bring up how he died. Oh, so we didn't bring up how either of them died, actually. Yeah, she dies, um he gets frightened and accidentally harpoons her and he's thinking like because the whole movie the the most the most supernatural thing in the movie is this is this crying dugon sound that's haunting them that's basically her her unborn baby crying is is what it's supposed to represent and so there's a lot of creepy noises throughout the movie and he accidentally shoots her with the harpoon and then he just runs away and he makes it to the road and just as he's flagging down a car a bird flies into the driver's face and it gets plowed over. It's very similar to the ending of Texas Chainsaw Massacre, actually. True, yeah. Minus the bird. You um, know what sucks, too, about the dugong, now that I'm thinking about it? I'm like, that dugong is probably definitely going to die. Oh, yeah. When I went to Galapagos years ago, like in tw- at the end of 2021, um, we saw a lot of um, sea lions, which, you know, mm-hmm. I know are not the same, but they're kind of like, from, if anything, they're more capable than dugongs are. Yeah, yeah. But we saw quite a lot of sea lions, and we saw some babies. And there were some babies that we saw that were dead or dying. And there was one uh, baby sea lion. I'll never forget. This poor little thing was so skinny, so skinny, yeah. and had flies all over it. I was just like, oh, no. But it was still alive, and it was still moving around. And like we asked, like the naturalist that was with us, it was just like, hey, this one looks really like, you know, sick. And they're like, yeah, they're like, the mother is probably away trying to get food for it. But if they can't get enough food, you know, they can't really like come back until they have enough to feed it. Right. And I remember this, late, this baby sea lion was going towards another adult sea lion that was feeding its own baby. And the mother sea lion was just like yelling at this other sea lion, like, get away from me. Like, I do not not have food for you. No, there's just like, I only have, I think they only give birth like one at a time, like we do. So it's Mm -hmm. just like, they're they're not going to, you know, waste their milk or whatever on someone else's baby. They're only going to feed their own. So I was just like, you know, and obviously in Galapagos, they believe in, you know, the the, uh, survival of the fittest. They can't interfere. They can't do nothing. as natural as possible yeah yeah they can't really interfere and save the baby sea lion as you know it's just like it's 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 how things happen there and i'm just like this sucks but i get it you know so thinking about that baby dugong i'm just like oof yeah and well and there's He's a very fucked. brief shot of of baby ducks after he shoots their mother um by act when he's just shooting off into the water 
so it, it's it's between the the eagle egg and those two things. There's three natural metaphors for either parentless babies or babies that have been killed, and mm-hmm. parents are upset. Yeah, yeah, they really drive it home. <laughs> they sure do. Yeah, but I um, mean, this you, is really good and very yeah. thematically strong. Yeah, and I think it's it's just like a genuinely good um, like you know, horror movie from the standpoint that it's scary, but not, not necessarily flashy horror movie, which if you don't have anything else to say about long weekend Razorback from oh 1984 my. is oh my Lord. absolutely flashy as flashy as you can be. That opening um, scene. I lost my mind. I was like, <laughs> what just happened? I was like, how did so much, I was like, how did so much happen in so little time? Do you yeah, want to explain it, what happens in this opening scene? Because I was shocked. Well, I'm trying, okay, I'm trying to remember the order of events here. It, it's, this is about a killer, uh, a giant mutant Razorback. And that's, I mean, there's other stuff going on in the story. But, now, explain um, a Razorback because I didn't even know what that, that was. I a was Razorback like, razor- is a, is I, I thought that was a, a name. I thought that was like a nickname they gave him like, oh, his, like, it's like how the shark in Jaws is Bruce. I mean, I no, know no, that, but I, like... I don't remember. I could look it up. I don't remember if they're pigs or pecaries. I think they're, they're pecaries or they're boars. Yeah, I guess that's a third option. But they're not nearly as big as the one in the movie. The one in the movie is like three times larger than an actual. And it's not. Bear. And he's not big because of any like scientific reason. No, he? he's just supposed to be like a mutant. I think he's just like a naturally occurring mutant. But he's so big. That at the beginning of the movie, he rips up a house and kills a child. We don't see him kill the child or it. You are um, you are you are under underselling this because this freaking pig. You don't even see it. Like you see like a shadow of it basically. Because mm-hmm. I'm like I don't know what this is. I don't know what a razorback is. I had I went into this completely blind. I looked up nothing, okay. and this pig runs through this house, steals a baby, and. Like it's like it, it runs through the house so fast. Like this this scene takes like not even like twenty seconds. And he rips a hole through the house and it is like comical how this pig mm-hmm. has destroyed his house. Everything is on fire. It's like, like the Tasmanian devil or something. It like, is, like like it is yeah. bonkers. I'm like, and then the grandpa runs out and it's just like no, and the whole house is on fire. It looks like Gone with the Wind. I'm like, are you kidding me? Is this how the movie opens? Well, like, what, what is happening? Here's the backstory here. So this was directed by Russell Mulcahy, based on a story by Peter Brennan. Just put that out there. I don't know who Peter Brennan is, but, you know, give him credit. Mulcahy is a important, and, in, and you might not know this, but once I say it, you're going to go, oh, yeah, that makes sense. He was a very important figure in early music videos. When people like talk MTV about the MTV era? Yeah, when people say the MTV style and when critics whined about MTV style in the 80s and 90s, they're talking about Mulca- Russell Mulcahy and his people. It wasn't until like David Fincher well into the 90s that you have the like, oh, these guys are actually really good. Like they were just the trash because they were all style, no substance, blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. And that makes sense this, because like, yeah, I can see it like in this movie, like it looks very. It's so stylized to the, mm-hmm. I mean, to the point where it's ridiculous. And, and it's like it. <laughs> I mean, the other movie had this sort of comic book, um, uh, the EC comic irony to it. This is the physical manifestation of comic book panels. It's so colorful and the angles are so extreme. And it's like almost like Sam Raimi yeah, stuff. Yeah, I was going to gonna the... bring that up. I was like, it's very Raimi like type yeah. of stuff thrown in here. Like, like, yeah, the pig might as well be the evil dead force at some point. <laughs> yes. Apparently the pig thing didn't work just like the Jaws thing. And that's why it's not featured that much. But I, it feels like it was all done on purpose. Just Like it's it a big animatronic pig. Yeah. And it just didn't work well. But it feels like they absolutely did everything they did on purpose. But I'll, I'm going to run down a couple of Mulcahy's uh, greatest hits here. He directed the first video ever shown on MTV, which was Video Killed the Radio Star by the Buggles. No way. He he did uh, Turning Japanese by the Vapors. He oh did Empire State Human by the Human League. He did Wonderful Christmas Time by Paul McCartney. <gasps> I love that he song. Did, I know everybody hates that song, but I uh, but, love that, it. I don't know what that video looks like. I know a lot of these, though. He did Tonight I'm Yours, parentheses, Don't Hurt Me from Rod Stewart. Uh, he did, um, okay, he did a lot of Elton John videos. His yeah. most... Well, he did Billy Joel's Pressure, which I, 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 and you might hate me for saying this. I can't remember if you're a fan. I actually hate Billy Joel quite a bit, but no. Pressure <laughs> is a great song. 
I love that song. <laughs> I think we have talked about this. Because uh, and pressure I... is a is a is a cool music video too. And then he did Def Leppard's portion "Sugar on Me." I used to love that song when it came out. Um, it's probably I mean it's terrible. a fun song. Yeah, I would do his, that song at karaoke. <laughs> his big claim to fame though is Duran Duran. He was Duran Duran's go-to guy. So he did Rio, Hungry Like the Wolf, all those Duran, I mean, into the 90s, he did all Duran Duran's music videos. Nice. So, and then he did Queen's Princes of the Universe, which was the theme song to The Highlander, which was the second movie he made right after Razorback. Uh-huh. And so we're talking a lot about this, but you know, this, this is just like, this is a guy who wants to make a feature film and he's offered, some guy wanted to make a Jaws ripoff. They called it Jaws on Trotters. Um, I'm not including this on that Jaws without the shark episode I mentioned earlier, because I don't think it has a lot in common with Jaws personally, other than no, the hunter guy. And the hunter guy has way more backstory than Quint uh, has in uh, Jaws. He has so way more I, pathos. Yeah, I know? don't think there's that much in common. Um, there's one scene where the main character, I haven't even described the plot yet, but the main character actually gets refuge from smaller razorbacks in water because they can't swim so it's like an Mm -hmm. opposite jaws situation that was kind of neat but but it's 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 very rock and roll movie from a rock and roll director who basically had one real hit in his career which was highlander but has continued making movies i might he made a ricochet with denzel washington and John Lithgow are you kidding me he did yeah. that movie that movie that, rules so freaking hard yeah so I, he's done other good movies oh sure. my god i love that movie i watched it like when we were in lockdown with like mike flynn and a bunch of other like chud guys and i'd never even no. heard of it i'd never heard it, of it and then i saw like how denzel just like looks in the movie and it's um what's his name john lithgow is like yeah lithgow is the, the villain movie. yep and yep I'm, like and i'm watching this i'm like this is the most insane thing i've ever seen in my life like john lithgow is ballistic it's yeah. crazy so and now that i'm thinking about it i'm like damn those i was like this is very similar to razorback he has he has his thing you know and then the the big flop he's known for is the shadow the alec baldwin shadow oh uh... Which um, is a movie I was going to defend until I rewatched it, and it was actually kind of boring. And so I don't really want. To. <laughs> You're he like, also Let me run this back. he also uh, made the worst Resident Evil movie, which is unfortunate because mm-hmm. almost all the other ones were the same guy. So he did Extinction, which was the one that kind of looked like Mad Max, but was really boring. But recently, he was executive producer and director of the MTV Teen Wolf show, which apparently is very popular. So he made a lot of money off that. It is. It is very popular. Like that show. I did. I never watched it, but that show was massive. Yeah. um, That's actually really cool. Actually, like good for him. Like he seems to have a very uh, eclectic career. And then on top of that, he uh, is using cinematographer Dean Semler who shot Mad Max 2 and 3 and won the Academy Award for Dances with Wolves. Nice. Um, so yes, this is this is this is a a important music video director working with an Oscar winning cinematographer and showing a version of Australia where everyone has a fucking blue black light and a floodlight in their yard <laughs> and everybody has a smoke machine in their kitchen. It's just everything and it, it's just as operatically 80s as you can possibly get minus those those paintings of white women that it's like the cover of the Rio album, the Duran Duran yeah. album. I can't remember that artist's name. There's none of those. I know who you're talking about. Yeah. I like those, um, the, that, that art style. That's like yeah. in salons and stuff now. Anyway. So, so the plot really quick is, yeah, this guy's baby is killed and it's, it's a sort of tongue in cheek reference to the whole Dingo ate my baby thing, which was a real event where a woman's baby disappeared and she blamed a dingo and there was a whole there was like a um, murder trial and stuff yeah right? there's a whole trial and so the trial at the very beginning of this movie is sort of a tongue and cheek cheek reference to that but yeah it's a true story you can look into it um but so it starts with that and then uh we go to new york or um the best version of new york that they could make in australia which oh is very god that was ridiculous i had to rewind to see that i was like i was like did somebody just go i'm walking here like i was like what's happening <laughs> it's like they maybe they they flew in a couple american cars or maybe they just added license plates but it, it's and their really? apartment is very unconvincing i haven't even been to new york and i know what a new york apartment doesn't look like they did that. like they did like like b-roll footage of like the manhattan skyline in the yeah 80s. Like, oh the twin towers and then they cut to like somebody going i'm walking here <laughs> well and, and 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 apparently it was supposed to be a 
they wanted this movie to make money. They wanted this to be an international release. So they were trying to add. So the two main, well, the main character, this is woman and her husband. At one point he gives her a ring. So I thought she was his fiance, but then he refers to her as, as his wife. So I guess that he was just giving her a ring uh, for fun, but she is a investigative journalist and she's going to Australia to investigate um, rumors of a kangaroo meat in dog food or something like that which is another thing I think was based on a true story. But the thing about that is, is, is I, I feel like this was really made for an international audience because from what I understand, it's not that big a deal to kill and eat kangaroos. It's not super normal or, but, but again, they're like deer out there. It's not. So people eat them like, like the way we do, like some people eat venison here. Yeah. It, it's I not. And, venison, and there's, but... there's so many of them that they have culls. There's a, another movie I actually would not recommend watching if you if you got a sensitive stomach called Wake and Fright from 1971, which is just this hallucinogenic kind of horror movie. It's like the ultimate version of this whole thing where like a city boy goes to the outback and everything goes insane. But there's one scene where it's borderline unwatchable where he goes on a kangaroo call and the fil- filmmakers just went along and filmed them mowing down like dozens and dozens of kangaroos. This movie does not have any on-screen animal killings. There, there's like some carcasses that I don't even know for real. But they it's, look it's really like, real. They, I, they might be. And, and But it's like they make this big deal about how this is like so awful that this woman would come all the way from New York to invest this animal rights uh, investigative journalist when it's just it. From what I understand, it just wouldn't be a big deal. It, like maybe it would be like if they put kangaroo meat in something without telling people it was kangaroo meat, it would be a big deal. Like I remember horse, the, the rumor of horse meat being in dog food in America. That was like a huge, huge like story. Right. And it was really that is because they didn't tell people is really what the problem is. And so I'm not necessarily saying go out there and eat kangaroo, but well, I think yeah, I, that's the thing. I think hearing something like that would like scandalize people. It's just like, Oh my God, kangaroo yeah. meat and stuff like that. It's just like, it's just yeah, not. sometimes people eat that. But it's so funny because it's like, it turns out that it's this whole underground operation of these two really skeezy characters have this whole like underground facility where they just grind up kangaroo meat and, and it's just like this big industrial machine. And okay. it's like I dank. have a thing about that where it's just like, all right, so this like underground meat grinding organization thing that they have where they're like killing uh, animals and grinding them. Why do they have signs everywhere? I don't know (laughs) where their factory is. And it's just like, Oh, it's so big. You can't hide it. You can't. Yeah. It's it's like this, it's like this big factory that looks like it's from like a freaking, uh, uh, FW Murnau like movie. I was like, Mm -hmm. it looks like the freaking cabinet of Dr. Caligari. Like what is And there's floodlights everywhere. Again, there's floodlights everywhere in this. Yeah. Yeah. And they have big signs that says pet pack. I think it's like Mm -hmm. the name, I guess, of the company that sells like the dog food. And it was just like, you guys are not, do, doing anything to hide this at all and no. so the the investigative journalist she goes down there and of course i guess because she's american everyone just looks at her like what are you doing here like yeah it's like an extreme version of all the other movies where an australian person from like melbourne goes out into the outback and nobody trusts them yeah uh, it, it they made her an american it's like leaning into that that what's it called that stereotype that australia is just full the of the bogeys girls. yeah yeah and so um, she goes, investigates, and she's getting chased. And, and it's very, there's a pretty upsetting scene where she's captured and they're threatening well, to he, before her. Before that, before they, they before get into that, because that. that scene was actually like very upsetting, very like, I was just like, oh, this is like, that's crazy. Yeah, but the scene before scene. where she gets caught like outside their window, I was just like, you guys are, I was like, was this a take you guys decided to go with? Because I was like, <laughs> I was like, I was like, you guys just seem pretty calm because she's just like she she's like she has like the camera. She's not even with her camera guy because it's her and a camera yeah. guy, right? Yeah. She decides to yeah. go by herself to follow these guys as they're bringing like their their animal carcasses to like the the canning factory, and she's just shooting it on her own through the camera. And one of the bad guys, I forget which one it is. They're like brothers or something, right? Yeah, I don't know if they're related, but they're definitely like. A, a, there are a, a, a no, no, no there are brothers because like the guy was like yelling at the end he's like where's your brother and it's just like, oh I he does it, okay yeah yeah so i and he like busts through the window and it's just like he's and it's like they're like talking very calmly at each other he's like what are you doing here 
what do you think? And she's just kind of like, I she's just like, like, and I was just like, why are you guys being so calm about this? Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that's it's not like anybody in town that. is looking to protect her. Like everybody wants no. her to leave. It's yeah, one they of those do. situations. Um, but uh, anyway, yes, <clears throat> to continue after that, they chase her and they try to like assault her. And it's just like, they try uh, to assault her. And it's like the longest scene. I was like, oh my God, like how much longer is this going to go on? <laughs> Yeah, it's it's well, it's really intense. And so the thing Christine brought up that I should have caught because I end up talking about this on the podcast all the time is I think that that is a reference to Psycho and that Psycho kills the who you think is the main character at the halfway through the movie, a little yeah, less yeah, than yeah. halfway through the movie. And so I think what the filmmakers were trying to do there is is the audience is waiting for this woman to die because she's asking all the wrong questions and we've all seen Psycho. But then they're like implying, oh, she's going to die in a really awful way. And I think it's just them like sort of tactlessly trying to really wind up the audience. And then the gag is that that the pig chases these guys off. So then it's actually kind of a good scare because then you're like, oh, thank God. She's like, oh, my God, the pig got her, you know, and it's it's a really intense. Well, that's the thing. It's because like you think she's going to get away. You yeah. know, she's going to get away and she's going to be able to invest. Then then it shifts gears where it's just like, oh, she's not going to investigate the the meat thing anymore and then she's gonna investigate the pig yeah you know? and you think but she's then, gonna solve the mystery of like the pig um you know eating this little boy right and it turns out no that's not the case she gets eaten and that ew, whole thing is like is a rig- so red hair yeah yeah and it's well it's and i think that they were basing of all the jaws things i feel like that's based on the first scene in jaws where the woman has jaws right under the water Yeah, but you don't hear like the crunching and yeah yeah so yeah i think that is a sort of psycho thing because then the just like in psycho the husband comes looking for her or the the fiance in the case of psycho uh it's funny because this guy uh there is a uh, he's gregory harrison is the actor's name and at the time people would have known him as trapper john md um, he was also on Falcon Crest. But do you know who Mul- Mulcahy wanted and who the producer thought didn't have the international appeal to hire? Jeff Bridges. They Jeff wanted Bridges. to hire Jeff Bridges? Yeah, Mulcahy's like, I don't know if they actually would have gotten him. He wasn't super duper famous in 19... 19- I mean, he was famous. Don't get no, me wrong. He's, he's like a Nepo baby, you know? Yeah, he has, he he's, he's famous. Dishes. But yeah, they could have probably afforded him at the time, and and they didn't get him for some reason. I don't think Gregory Harrison's bad, um, but just imagine Jeff Bridges in that role. I mean, I just have a, a vision of Jeff Bridges was it now, that, and I'm like that could have been kind of goofy, but who knows? I wonder if it was because Tron was such a notorious flop that the producers like, nah, people don't want to see that guy. He was in that Tron movie. I've never that seen the original weird. Tron. I've never seen any Tron movies actually. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kind of nice nice uh production design uh i guess anyway <laughs> anyways that could have been jeff bridges so Beautiful so guys. the guy goes he goes to investigate his wife's disappearance audience knows she's dead audience knows that the boar ate her he befriends the old hunters um sort of i don't know if she's like his protege she's like his adopted daughter but not officially who is actually an actress who is in uh her name's arky Whit- whitley um, and she's in Mad Max 2. So nice. she's kind of like a face that you recognize from Australian movies. And apparently there's a story, there's a very brief shower scene with her and she didn't want to do it. And they did the thing where they say, oh, it's OK, we'll get a body double. And then they let one of the production assistants slip like Ugh, the body double has a lot of cellulite. And so <gasps> she changed her mind and said she wanted to do it so they, they never kidding. actually had a body devil they tricked her into it but, they, but they it's very brief. yeah it's very brief too like you That's see the thing, it's like, they don't show they don't it's not like the kind of shower scene where you're like you expect to be like there to like they don't really show it's anything. not all like, there's no ogling time there's just like a sort of like like just brief glimpse of her yeah it's just because there's an outdoor shower we see him in it too it's like equal opportunity i suppose that scene was so silly to me too because he's like he scares her while she's in the shower and it's an outdoor shower which is funny because like my grandma had one of those like at her house in like the, the countryside so i'm like oh okay i was like that's that's neat but he surprises <laughs> her with this outdoor shower and she's like ah and he's like and I guess because he's all dehydrated and stuff, he faints. And she's just kind of like, she gives him like that that look. It's just like, this guy. And it's oh, just this like, man. Oh, this man. It's just like, um, hello. Like, <laughs> you should be more upset right now. But she does, she does that kind of like, 
Oh, what this. I this. think she even spits out some water, like an exasperation, if I'm remembering correctly. <laughs> It's, I mean, it's a little, she's great. She's really cute and fun, and, and she is very capable, too. They needed like a sexy lady because they killed yeah, their other one. Right, but it's a little weird that they so quickly become love interests, but it's like, dude, you don't even know if your wife's dead yet. Like, you just yeah. know something bad's happened. Yeah, it's weird. But also, like, I don't recall, I mean, if we're going to bring up the Psycho thing again, I don't recall there being, like, another girl in Psycho. There, there is, was, her right? sister. Her sister oh, goes along. it's her the sister. The two of them investigate. Yeah, but they don't try to push them as, like, a thing. No, they never have any romantic connection. It's, like, it's all business between them and in, in, in that movie, <laughs> for sure. They're like, we got to get to the bottom. Well, they think they think that, that she's still alive, I think, in Psycho. I think I, that's that. I mean, that's the thing. They imply that she's still alive. I think they kind of just didn't think it through. That it's just like, oh, right. They're yeah. not like sure. Yeah. You yeah. Know? So that part doesn't really work. But she's a, a charming enough actress. And it's kind of fun having her be like the sidekick to this gruff old pissed off man. Because okay. only uh, Razorback's only only has two states deadly or deadly and dead is like the only that's all they <laughs> yeah. are it's, or it's dangerous like, and dead or something dangerous like that. and dead yeah <laughs> yeah that poor old man though like <laughs> yeah he, really he doesn't him, he doesn't get to he doesn't get his hero's moment it's, i do find it, it goes, interesting that they that they i mean i thought it would have been interesting just for me like if he had gone to jail like imagine yeah. if he had gone to jail for like who knows however like, many maybe, years yeah, like you know, three years gets off for good behavior. I feel like that I mean, would have made it, that would have made me more pissed. It's just like I'm going to kill this freaking pig when I see him. Yeah, and they do do the thing where like basically the whole um uh not city the whole town assumes he did something wrong. So he's he's like already been poisoned in in everybody's eyes. Mm-hmm. It's definitely he's in, definitely in a bad place. And the pig burned his house down, so he's like sleeping in his yeah. The pig actually like tears up another dude's house really bad too. He rips a guy's TV off off doesn't oh rip the TV God. off the wall. He rips the wall with the TV into, and drags I it off. I took a drink and, at the same time and almost died just now. But I'm like, oh, that was the <laughs> silliest thing. That yeah. was crazy. And I'm like, this pig stole this budget. man's whole freaking TV. <laughs> Sometimes I get lost when I'm watching low budget movies and I'm like, wait, how did they do that with no money? Because like a big budget movie, they just build a house and rip it up. But like, was that a model? It didn't look like a model. Like it's no. just And it just it went off into the distance and you see the TV turn off from very far Finally away. turn off. Yeah. And yeah, then yeah. the guy's just sitting there and it's very funny. It's like a joke. I was just like, what is this? And you would think, I, would that guy then like go to somebody and be like, Hey, you will not believe what happened to me. What? <laughs> the 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 Blu-ray has a pretty long making of documentary that I should have rewatched. I saw it years ago. And I I have this vague memory of them saying that that was sort of added after the fact because they needed more pig time in the movie. And that's why it doesn't really fit with anything else. It's so funny. It's like, I was like, what type of like, silly gag is this? I was like, why did, a t- why did a pig steal a TV? I was like, isn't the whole thing is that the pig eats people? Why didn't he eat that man? And he was a fat man. I was like, that pig could have had a very good dinner that night. Like yeah. he could have had a TV dinner right there. And the pig is just like a, another force of nature thing. Like it doesn't really have much personality other than being furious and angry. And no, you squealing. don't even see him that much. So they kind of try to do like the Jaws thing, but it's just like yeah. there's also. I mean, the thing about it, I think that that makes Jaws so great. Why people love it so much is because there's also this political aspect mm-hmm. about Jaws. There's not really that with this pig. At least no. I don't think so. I, I mean, like I, I said, the... how you feel about you know. Uh, animals being used eating. for yeah and and even still like it's not like they're killing razorbacks they're killing kangaroos that's like way easier to kill it's just like fuck yeah. it they're dead all over the place here anyway yeah and it and it's yeah it's it's i think that eco horror part but then i mean it's also the movie isn't exactly positive towards the environmentalist lady she's sort of a moron she's no. stupid everything she does is is dumb like it's she puts dumb. herself in very dangerous situations um, also, something I just remembered is that this carries the, the baby thing because she's supposed to be pregnant when she dies. Oh, that's right. So, like, that's I, I, I don't, I didn't realize that when I watched them until I watched them in a row. I'm like, oh yeah, these are both sort of about dead babies. <laughs> <laughs> How about that? Oh my god. Well, because it makes it makes it more tragic, I guess, that you know this woman dies. It's like it's not sad enough that a woman died. She also had to be pregnant on top of it. Mm-hmm. 
and like a lot of like good zombie movies and good monster movies the the monster's not really the bad guy it's the humans it's the shitty humans that are the bad guys um putting themselves in bad situations and like you can tell who the bad guys are based on how obnoxious their laughs are like the the worse the laugh the worse the villain basically well, the, the two brothers are like the biggest morons and it's yeah like... they're they're barely they, they barely function like they only know how to process be, be bad <laughs> That's be bad and process kangaroo meat that's all they know how to do that's their their lot in life and they and, live in and, these and assault tunnels women. and they just get i mean the dude's not he's just a guy and he just like after he has this whole like walkabout bit which i'm pretty sure is a reference to the nicholas rogue movie walkabout mm. which is like the australian, australian new wave movie. movie yeah yeah it's like it's like after that movie came out australian movies were like oh wait yeah a minute, maybe sorry boss special. lerman you did not have a chance well, like, like, well, Boz Lerman probably owes a debt to walk about, I would say. Like, I don't think we would have uh, movies like, uh, what's his, first, what's his early movie? Uh, uh, strictly, strictly, strictly Ballroom. Strictly Dancing. Strictly Ballroom. Strictly Ballroom. Yeah, yeah. Strictly I don't Dancing think... is the, the competition show from the you, you wouldn't have had, you wouldn't have had uh, 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 Priscilla Queen of the Desert without it, for sure. Mm. I mean, yeah. But yeah, so the, the villains are, are not even good at their job. And the dude who's not even super powered or trained or anything t- takes them out. He just scares the shit out of them. And yeah, it's got this breakdown where he goes on a walkabout and it's just style just for days with not much substance. But yeah, there's not a lot of subtext in this one like the last one. And I made a short list if uh, people like the idea of Killer Pig and Pickery and Boar movies. Um, there were quite a few made in the post-millennial era i don't know why but uh, there's one called squeal from 2008 about a human pig hybrid i haven't seen that one uh pig hunt from 2008 as well there's a korean movie called chaw that i have seen from 2009 which is pretty good uh there's one from 2011 called prey and there's a one called hogzilla from 2014 (laughs) apparently that one's a mockumentary comedy the idea that it's oh. a mockumentary comedy sounds interesting and there was one in 2017 called boar that is a pseudo remake of razorback that i have not seen incidentally the movie pigs which we covered previous podcasts is not about killer pigs it's about pigs that killers feed the bodies to after the fact so i don't think that... do you have anything I like, else i did no, like no. the scene where like the little baby pigs kind of like knocked down <laughs> <laughs> the guy yeah. from like from like the uh the the fan or whatever like he goes yeah, the... he climbs up to sleep on like those like fans that you see in like on like farms yeah there's and, like, i the guess they're windmills pigs, uh, yeah they're they're they're, they're to measure or weather wind. vanes or something like that yeah they're to measure where the wind's coming from that's and i think they're mostly just decorative <laughs> yeah but he climbs up there to sleep and then the baby pigs just like knock him down i'm like what is happening like, you here? Think, like you think you could get away from us, huh, buddy? Huh, buddy? Yeah, <laughs> those are like normal size razorbacks. Those no baby pigs. That's I'm what thinking, they look like normal. Do you remember like the Silence of the Lambs sequel? Was it in Hannibal where they had like yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Gary Oldman has like those pigs that like eat people. Huge boars. Yeah. Do pigs eat people? If you feed them to them, yeah, pigs will eat anything. They can eat bones and stuff. Um, okay. It's also a thing in Deadwood. That's how they get rid of bodies on the show Deadwood. Is, Are you um, kidding me? Yeah, there's a Chinese um, guy who runs a pig farm, and that's where they dump all the bodies because the pigs just eat them all. That's uh, crazy. Because that's the yeah, thing. I just thought about that because I was just like, is that something you have to teach them to do, or is that something that they I do? Think that because I'm like, are they carnivores? Eat, they're or- herbivores. They can eat whatever, and they got strong jaws. Like, yeah, they'll just eat stuff. So they're like, er- I think- so so they're so uh, what is it? What is it when they eat both? We we eat both. Uh, what, omnivore. Sorry, I meant omnivores. omnivores. I said herbivore. I meant omnivore. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. They're so omnivores. Can... They'll eat whatever. That's crazy. That's, but like boars I mean, specifically, or like no, any no, any, any of sort pigs. of pigs. Yeah. Like if um, on farm, pigs eat all sorts of weird crap. With depending on who the farmer is, I think most of them. Eat I guess that feed, explains but... why certain cultures um don't eat won't eat them. Pork. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's why because, they're considered filthy. <laughs> yeah. No, because I get it. I mean, like. Because, you know, cows and chickens, they just eat grass. But technically, chickens eat. also eat meat, too. The, it's weird. Yeah, They're but not, not like it's a main diet. No, like, they just, if they see a mouse, they'll be like, oh, cool, what's that? And then they'll just put it in their mouth because they're stupid. They're very stupid. <laughs> they are stupid, but pigs are very smart. Pigs Pig- are smart. Goats are um, smart. 
I mean, cows are yeah. reasonably smart. Yeah, I guess that explains why some cultures do not eat pork. I just I didn't know that about pigs. I thought that was something that was just like Yeah, they won't like as far as I know, they don't like hunt people. I don't think they hunt anything really. I think that they're they're um opportunistic feeders. Uh, yeah. Relatable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, like that's what humans are basically. And we do some of us hunt, but most of us don't. Anyway, that's Razorback. Great movie. Yeah, it was um, fun. Moving on to a movie, it was technically released before Razorback, but same year, and it felt better putting the two Australian movies next to each other. So going from a great movie to a uh, huh, movie, uh, this is Wild Beasts from 1984. It's an Italian movie. Its Italian title is Belvi Feroci, um, and it is AKA Zoo Terror, which is a much, much better title than Wild yeah. Beasts, which is not very descriptive. Um, and because this is an Italian movie, it was shot without sound and dubs. So voice quality is a little weird and the voices don't match the actors. Okay, so this- basically all the actors on in this movie are, I mean, obviously they're dubbed by American actors. Yeah, and the version we watched was the um, English dubbed one. I think these are mostly Italian actors, if I remember right. This was a movie really made more for Italian audiences, so they didn't include like, uh, you know, a couple of Americans for the fact for the international sales or anything like mm. that. But yeah, it makes it if you're not used to Italian movies, it's sort of a strange sensation because it's, it's never the lip sync just never matches, and you just sort of learn to ignore it. Um, yeah, I it kind of I didn't really notice it too much because I just kind of like I was like yeah. This is a foreign movie with yeah. American actors dubbing over it. So I'm just like, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm and it's really funny if you've accustomed seen... to them. So I just kind of was just like, all right, whatever. If you've seen enough Italian movies from the era, the, a lot of the voices are super recognized. Well, there's only like a couple dozen American actors that dub these things. So like you'll mm-hmm. have the same voices over and over again. It's kind of something nice about it. But this is the most irresponsible movie we're going to discuss. In part because it's Italian. And they don't have laws <laughs> at the time. At least not then, yeah. Yeah. Um, but this is uh, written and directed and produced by Franco E. Prosperi. Um, he is known as one of the godfathers of Mondo, well, along with, uh, I don't know how to say this first name, Giolatiro Giacopetti. Mm. Um, Ariani, do you know what a Mondo movie is? I don't. Okay, so. Have Mondo you heard the term means world? Exactly. Uh, yeah. So you've heard the term shockumentary, I'm guessing. Yeah. So these are these exploitation movies and uh, Prospari and Giacopetti and a guy named Paolo Cavera made a movie called Mondo Carne. It's a dog's world in 1962. And it was a shockumentary, very exploitative. Its whole point is to do a world tour of strange, sexy, grotesque cultural experiences pretty damn racist not nearly as racist as the genre would get but you know it's just like hey look at these african women with no tops on this is the only the beginning of how racist we can how no no okay not going to talk about on this just like like everybody who hasn't heard of it look up goodbye uncle tom and your spare time uh if you want to that's how racist it got but um this was super popular and it even won an oscar for best yeah, yeah. It won an Oscar for Best Original Song the year it came out. It was which, called, which movie? It was called Mondo Carne, but it's spelled C-A-N-E, so it looks like Mondo Kane. Oh. Um, 19, so, so it was popular worldwide, especially in Europe and Asia. And so Italians are famous for going, oh, shit, this made a dollar? Let's make 7,000 <laughs> of them quickly. <laughs> as we possibly can just like spaghetti westerns they made uh, a million spaghetti westerns for yeah. like six years and yeah. then they're like oh this isn't popular anymore fuck this i'm never <laughs> gonna make it a moment but so uh Jacopetti and Pers- uh, prosperi were really into it and then they would just start making shit up like they lost interest in the even umentary part of the whole thing and just went for the shock part and uh, to, to get a little dark here, their most notorious story, and it's never been proven one way or the other, but they were accused of either paying warlords to stage executions <gasps> or more likely asking warlords to wait until the light was better to do these executions. What? what? They did a movie that was called Africa Adio, um, which was released here as Africa Blood and Guts. It is maybe the most foul movie ever made. Uh, and it's just what? like a lot of it's faked, but a lot of it's real footage of war crimes 
basically what? in the Congo and stuff. Yeah, it's awful. And you've seen this movie? Uh, I did years ago. <gasps> Dave, I I basically I went I was I tried to see every I mean there I found my line basically. Back when I was in college, I I found a video store that had everything. And I like what the most famous Mondo movie was actually made by Americans. It's called Faces of Death. Most people have heard of Faces of Death. Yeah, I've heard of it. Faces of Death was mostly faked. And it's pretty obviously faked when you see it in retrospect. I mean, um, I hope so. Jesus. Yeah. Like, I mean, there's I, I and, and, but the I'm thing is, is then, things being fake, like it's OK. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there there's other things that I watched in college that were not fake. There was certain things where they would just compile actual footage of people dying on television. <gasps> And that was like my line. That's when I had to stop watching those. And for a lot of, for me, the Mondo movies are the same thing because they're just so xenophobic that they, they're they painful to watch. The Italians made something xenophobic? I can't yeah. believe it. Can you believe it? Can you believe it? <laughs> Shock. And so, and so the Mondo movies uh, sort of lead into the can- Italian cannibal movies, which you might have heard about. The what? Both- <laughs> Italian cannibal movies. Have you ever heard of Cannibal Holocaust? No. Cannibal Ferrex? Okay, so no. these are these are faked movies, but they're also quite racist. They're movies about white people, sometimes Italian, sometimes not, going into the bush, running into cannibals, being killed by the cannibals. Yo, the, like, of course, the people who invented fascism did this stupid yes. shit. Like, <laughs> Yes. And the funny thing about cannibal movies is it's almost always from the point of view is I wonder who the real cannibals are because look how awful these white people are being too. But then they get eaten by savages. So it's like, yeah, I think we know where you stand on this, buddy. Don't yes. don't even pretend. But Cannibal I Holocaust think. is is like a really, really well-made movie. It's one of the first oh, <laughs> found footage horror movies. The idea is a camera crew has gone to exploit cannibals okay. and right. gets killed I by mean, them. I mean, obviously nobody gets actually cannibalized, but they're trying to make no, a point. But right? Nobody the, gets cannibalized, right, Gabe? Nobody gets cannibalized. In fact, it was a big fiasco. I, I, I'm, I, you know, I'm never going to cover cannibal Italian cannibal movies. They're just too gross. So I'm just going to say, yeah. <laughs> it was a whole conspiracy. There's a whole thing where they actually paid the actors. It was Blair Witch is... In, in line with Cannibal Holocaust, they paid the actors to just not make public appearances for a year. And so some people were like, did these guys die? And so there was a whole court case like where they had to prove that the actors didn't get killed oh by cannibals. <laughs> so, dying. but I, I have a point here. I'm actually staying on topic this time. So you have the Italian cannibal movies, which come out, they're fictionalization that comes out of the Mondo movies. The two things these genres have in common is because it's cheap and because there's not laws against it, they would have animals attack each other or be killed for real on screen. That's what makes most of these movies unwatchable is that you'll have these goofy scenes of people getting killed, killing each other. And it looks really fake, but then they'll just toss in an animal getting killed for food or two animals fighting each other who wouldn't normally be fighting each other in nature. That's what keeps most people from being able to watch these movies. And I absolutely do not blame them. Cannibal Holocaust is a brilliantly made movie, but it is so morally bankrupt that I would not recommend anybody see it unless they're really curious about how found footage came to be or whatever. So that brings us to Wild Beasts, which is Prosperi trying to make a just straight horror movie. He's trying, I'm going to make a fictional movie with a script what should it be? Well, I have all this experience filming wild animals attacking each other. <laughs> so I guess I'll just make a movie make where a wild animals attack. It, yeah. 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 And, and, no. and it seems like the main character is being played by an actor who was at one point a circus t- lion tamer. So he kind of knows what he's doing. But otherwise, they're really putting people in very dangerous situations <laughs> with with deme- not domesticated or tame, but zoo animals. So like, you know, they're probably well fed and relatively calm and aren't going to attack you, but you can't know that. Yeah. And so it feels so irresponsible. The whole movie, you're just like, what did the behind the scenes of this look like? Like, well, have you heard the story of the movie Roar with Tippi Hedren from the birds, actually? I um, think I have, but it got a re-release know. It was this movie that her and her husband made, and it was supposed to be about a couple that uh, oh, lived wait, on a ranch. Oh, she got mauled on of... camera, didn't she? Everybody did. Um, oh. uh, her her daughter Melanie Griffith um, got it mauled. She was because the whole movie was shot with their family in the acting roles. She got fucked up. Um, Jan de Bont was the cinematographer. He got his skull ripped, or his scalp peeled off. What? Uh, 
I mean, it was bad. It was really I'm bad. One animal. Yeah, just like because even when they're playing, they're such powerful that big cats are so powerful that even when they're playing, they skin you basically. Like, ha ha, he he. Oops, you know. It's <laughs> like it's just the way it goes. And so that's that's probably the most irresponsible movie ever made. But Wild Beasts, I mean, there had to be some behind the scenes stories that we just don't know. Oh, no, um, this movie looked insane because I was like I was watching it early and I'm like, I was like, there's so many like I was like, these animals are not like fake. These are real yeah. actual animals. People are holding tigers and there's polar bears. And I'm like, that's not a fake polar bear. That's a real polar bear. It's a real like, polar where, bear. I was like, where did they get a polar bear? And how did somebody let them use a polar bear? There's all I these, think like, it was elephants. just a zoo animal. And I'm just like, but I'm like, this is crazy. I'm like, I can't. I can't. And like, the people are like two feet away from them. They're like, oh, yeah. I'm like, oh my God. Okay. The thing that got me was like right at the start, right? I think it opens with like somebody like chopping up like a horse or like a horse's head yeah they and, and they're like, is feeding that a real horse yeah i th- I think that they're literally feeding horse parts to the lions as like right, a but i'm like is this real i was like is that a real like horse? i'm pretty like, sure it's a real horse that is one of the most upsetting things i've ever seen yeah and i think it was a pre-slaughtered horse i don't think they killed the horse just for the movie I know which that, is like a I line like... i personally draw like i don't want to see animals killed but um if I am seeing animals kill, I want it to have been for another reason, not just the movie and that the movie just took advantage of it. You know, I was that like, oh, uh, I was like, I don't like that. I don't like that. I was like, that's crazy. No. I mean, it was very brief, but I was like, like, I literally kind of like, re- like rewinded it because I was just like, wait a minute. I was like, is that real? And it's a like, real dead horse. I know that real. much. And I was like, oh, yeah. my God. I was like, what And I can't imagine. I, I looked up where they filmed it, but most of it was shot in in Germany. And you can see there's signs up for the zoo that are a German zoo. And some of the 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 most dangerous scenes were shot in Italy. So there's a scene. So so the plot is very simple. The plot is someone gets PC. Uh, there's a is an animal rights group. So this is sort of an eco horror movie, but it's one that fucking hates animal rights activists. <laughs> um, but similar to what happens at the beginning of. T- 28 days later where they released the the rabid or the rage monkeys these people just put a bunch of pcp in the zoo water i guess uh, to release the zoo animal instead of just releasing them they make them crazed first so they just attack the town that's pretty much the plot of the movie there's there's stuff about this woman and her boyfriend and her uh daughter her latchkey child yeah um but it's not really very important (laughs) it's mostly just a series of animals attacking i think that nobody died or else we would have had stories about people actually dying but it sounds like things didn't go great it's insane to me that people did not die people did not lose limbs because i'm like remember when everyone watched tiger king and then everyone's just like waiting for something bad to happen and 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 he gets he gets messed up a couple times in tiger king like and and he's just playing with them that's that's what happens on roar too is the guy will be playing with them and the the tigers will just and the lions will just get too rough even if they love the guy which no i don't think they love tiger king he was a piece of shit but even if they love the guy they're still gonna play too hard you know so then i'm just like i can't believe nobody got eaten scratched trampled nothing i mean i feel like the elephants were probably circus elements elephants they're probably pretty well be i mean you can train elephants like those were african elephants but you can train indian elephants to do a lot of stuff without hurting people there is a funny the elephants are kind of like the low-key star of the movie because they just trample through scenes like it's like it's like elephant revolution is going on in in their little world and they just like break out of things like the hulk and the kool-aid man and there's there's rats (laughs) there's like rats that like are like raining yes is that this movie or was that the next movie i can't they're both tell. movies both movies have rat scenes and i do think that's something that bothers me is a lot of movies american italian a lot of movies will kill rats on screen because yeah. rats are considered vermin and i don't like that because i've had my cousins and friends have always had pet rats and rats are pretty cool they're did, nice um, little guys did last crusade kill any rats on screen I don't know if they did. I think that that was made under Hollywood scrutiny in the late 80s. I think that they didn't actually. But there are a lot of movies like um, Sam Peckinpah movies where they kill snakes. And it's just certain animals that are considered okay to kill by people. Um, 
and I like snakes too. Uh, you know, they're 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 cool creatures, and I've met a lot of pet ones that are nice. So, but yeah, this movie had way too many scary animals and way too many people just like on top of them. I, I was like, were they drugged? They were almost certainly on lots of drugs. Yes, they were full of food and on lots of drugs. So they went into the only animals that the, the least har- um, dangerous animal is probably the cheetah. Cheetahs are known to be reasonably safe around people. Oh yeah, but, reasonable. Ask yeah. Siegfried and or Roy. I don't know if they dealt they, with cheetahs. No, it was a. They dealt it with tigers. tigers, and they're just the tigers have huge feet. Cheetahs are just not. They're t- the same they're, kind of predators they're like they're like house cats but pretty yeah they're big. just big big fast house cats they're just not that dangerous um uh, and so i'm and and i think that's the I, I one not, scene i will not take your word for it let's no but say. don't because you never know but uh the one scene where an animal actually looks like it's having fun is that they have a scene where a cheetah chases a car and the cheetah oh, looks yeah. like it's having a good time it's, it's like, like yay Whoa! And it's a really funny scene because it causes this huge accident. And it's maybe the goriest scene in the movie because all these people just get mangled in the car accident. It's a very violent movie. <laughs> there, There's one gag that is a sort of famous reference. So there's a scene where this blind guy is attacked by his seeing eye dog. Oh, my God. <laughs> and so there's uh, the movie Suspiria, which I'm guessing you've at least heard of Suspiria. Yeah, I've um, watched it. You've seen, so do you remember, did you see the, the original, the 70s mm-hmm. one? Mm-hmm. So you remember there's a scene where seeing guy dog attacks a guy. <gasps> That's right. I forgot about that. And then a couple of years later, Lucio Fulci ripped it off for the movie The Beyond, where seeing eye dog attacks a lady. <laughs> so I feel like the, as soon as we see, we know there's a killer animal movie, and as soon as we see the seeing eye dog and the guy, the audience, the Italian audience is just going, oh, oh when, when's this go. dude going to be? When's yeah. it? So anytime he's alone with the dog, it's like, here it comes, here it comes. But <laughs> It, they they take a little while. They they take they a little a, while to get. Well, there. they had a lot of scenes in the beginning with all the animals just like drinking water, just it's being just normal. Like, yeah, no, but but like you know, getting all the PCP like, in their we system. We want you to see that all these animals are drinking water. This dog is drinking water, and this tiger's drinking water, and everybody's having a little sip of water. Hmm, something must be in the water. The funny thing is, is it's never explained why the people don't go yeah. crazy too. Actually, and, yeah. Except, Except for there's a gag at the very end. There's a whole subplot where the girl's latchkey daughter is in a dance class that gets sort of ransacked and they have to hide from a polar bear. <laughs> and um, at the end, all the children but her have drank water from the Cooligan man and they all go feral too. And that's sort of like the last minute startle is that all the kids are crazy too. But like, how did just the zoo and the dog and the Cooligan man end up with the PCP water. Why did no one oh, else in town? Maybe because like, did you see like the quote at the beginning of the movie? That something about, uh, it was in Italian, wasn't it? I yeah. don't remember what it said. Yeah, did it say I, no animals were harmed in this translator. movie? No, I put it into the okay. translator and it says something like, our madness infiltrates the lives of animals and children. Aha. Uh-huh. So, I so think, that was their excuse is that it's supernatural. Yeah. Or or like, <laughs> I guess the PCP is symbolic of something. Uh-huh. But then they actually wrote in that PCP killed it. They made them actual PCP. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure PCP was like like a cool, buzzworthy drug at the time. Mm-hmm. The, something must have happened. Because it makes around. you go crazy and see things and yeah. do things and be aggressive and violent and all that. Um, so this is just a really like elaborate anti-drug PSA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. The, well, the animal cruelty part, a lot of it is just that zoos used to really suck. Like, even just the scenes of animals chilling at the zoo, they look fucking miserable, and then they no, just yeah. the little cages. And it's, like, nice that zoos aren't like that anymore, at least most zoos that I've ever been to. No, most zoos now are just about conservation and yeah. education and yeah. protection and all that, so... Well, back to the irresponsible part. They have to agitate these animals in some way to make them look angry about the PCP. It's supposed to be in their system. So something is not going well. And they did, there is a scene where a bunch of rats attack a cat. And my assumption there is they've covered the cat with something tasty and that the cat is actually fine. Well, not anymore. It was 1984. Cats don't live that long. But <laughs> um, my guess is that, that the cat didn't actually get hurt. All by these the, animals are dead. It's up maybe the yes. elephants. Yeah, the elephants might be alive, especially the younger ones. They they can live a while. And and then there's a scene where you're talking about like animals getting hurt. There is a scene where they put lions amongst 
cattle beef. And I'm like, oh, they're just going to be like, there's like a mirror, like a, a, a plexiglass separating them. And then there's a shot of a lion literally attacking a beef cow. <laughs> and I was like, what? How irresponsible are you to put lions in with a bunch of prey that lions that are not used to hunting, for one thing, because they're zoo lions, mm-hmm. and then get them all hopped up on killing shit? Like, how are you going to get them back in their cage now that they've killed a, a, a beef cow? And like, what did the beef place okay this did they like have a list of like like hey we're gonna just release a couple lions don't worry it'll be fine we'll pay for any cows they eat and the beef place was like yeah cool i can't be a uh, a health hazard or anything <laughs> i'm sure it's fine that 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 part really like oh my god they're just letting it but that you know i guess that goes back to the mondo and cannibal movies where they just let animals eat each other um i like the lead actor with the with the mustache like <laughs> yeah he and he's the one who's like a real lion tamer from a circus apparently oh which, is that right you, yeah so like we gotta hire somebody that knows what they're doing yeah and so if you look he's the only one of the main cast who spends real time with animals the kids i think they were careful with the kids because you never see the kids there's one shot where you see kids run into a room and you see the polar bear at the other end of the hallway mm-hmm. and the polar bear is moving so slow that i'm pretty sure that he's drugged out of his mind <laughs> Or, or there's like plexiglass there separating them. But I don't think they ever put any of the children in, in any major danger. No, uh, I hope not. But I was just like, they had to find a lot of kids that were willing to just be <laughs> up close yeah, I mean, all these well, freaking animals and their parents, like allowing them to do it too. It is one of the things in the movie's advantage is that the scenes with the kids feel really natural. They just feel like kids hanging out. And I guess it's because they wanted English speaking kids, even though they were going to dub their voices later. And so oh. they they went to a um, army school in Germany and they just so they filmed all the scenes. So those are just army brats. Plus, the one girl was an actress, the main girl. Oh, so cool. there's really just kids hanging out. And that's why so many scenes are just them drinking water and like, not doing any real <laughs> acting or anything. Um, but it kind of works. It kind of feels more natural that way. They don't feel like actor kids. I like that part. It, it feels a little it like. I, I was really, at the beginning of the movie, the way they introduced the little girl getting changed, I was like, uh-oh, did I accidentally tell Ariana Oh, yeah, you messaged me about that. I'm like, but... oh, crap. But it's really just the one shot. And I think, you know, every country has different standards for nudity with children. Yeah. Um, but and it was but, like, uh, but, then... but obviously, like, for us in America, we're like, oh, oh I don't like yeah. that, you know? And so I was, like, a little afraid that they were going to overdo it. But it's really just, she's just getting dressed at the beginning of the movie, and then mm-hmm. it's just a bunch of kids running around in their in their dance uniforms it's not they don't yeah. sexualize them so i, I there, there was a minute where i was like oh, i fucked up i don't remember <laughs> this happening in this movie because i had seen it one time before i suggested it but then but then yeah it wasn't that so i, I the lo-fi beats in this movie cracked me up like whenever like something like like an animal was on a rampage or something serious they had like these like funky like 80s like yeah synth- like beats and i was like what is this what is happening <laughs> and i didn't know the composer um i was thinking that i would like look up the composer and it would be like one of those uh, i know a lot of the italian composers this was someone i wasn't familiar with but but the one i really like is that the opening credits have like they look like an 80s primetime drama about the waterworks or something like <laughs> It's like showing like all these shots of the city and it's playing like it sounds like the L.A. law theme or like Dallas theme or something. It's like this exciting like like adventures in the city. Look at the waterworks. It's like it's very strange. And then the movie ends with the same song like you've been watching crazy shit. Woo! <laughs> I, I made a little list of like the greatest hits because um, <laughs> it's really is just a series of people getting killed. Because uh, the thing, I was just like, I was like, this is just like a bunch of different animals. It's like a wrecking. It's shit. a slasher movie. It's like a slasher movie. It's like it's like we want to see the the murders basically. There's a scene where there's a couple necking in a car and they're attacked by the rats, mm-hmm. and that's the one scene where I think they actually probably killed rats. At the very least, they scared the shit out of rats with a flamethrower. Because some of the rats being flamethrowed are very clearly fake, but there are other ones that are running away from the flames. But that's pretty pretty graphic scene. Um, the elephants stomp a lady to dra- death and strangle a guy, which uh, and you hear like crunching noises and stuff. And that leads to the best joke in the whole movie. That's a purposeful joke. It might have just been put in by the dubbers, but um, the police are saying we can't find the elephants. And the dispatcher's like, how the fuck? 
Can you not find elephants? <laughs> What's happening? <laughs> I thought the mice and men joke was pretty cute. That was a good one. Yeah, you're right. You're I was right. like, I was like, oh. I was like, I wonder if this is like an American joke. I mean, yeah. It... Sometimes the dubbers would just add the jokes because it would fit the lip sync. Yeah. So yeah, you're never really sure if that was an original gag, unless it's something visual on screen telling us mm-hmm. it was. Um, apparently, the 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 the, pla- the scene where the elephants crash and and mess up a uh, airplane or make an airplane crash, I should say. <laughs> They're just on the runway for no reason, and the airplane crashes to avoid hitting them. So, like the death, the death, um, the body count is got to be huge, considering they kill a whole plane full of people at one point. And apparently, one of the elephants stepped on the director's foot while they were filming that scene. Oh. So that's that's cool. He got they got a little revenge for messing with them. Uh, yeah, the, the cheetah. I have the cheetah actually being terrorists. Yeah, they're just like yeah, elephant revolution now. Let's just they're, they're letting us rampage, guys. Let's do it. Oh my god! And then there's like a a cow stampede through town, and the IMDb facts claims that the whole film was going to be shot in Johannesburg, uh, that's the other city, uh, South South America, and uh, so much bad press came South out Africa? of them. South Africa, yes, sorry, <laughs> uh, Johannesburg, South Africa, and the uh, bad press for letting cows run through the street was so bad that they got chased out of town. <laughs> Amazing. Some fucking Italians are just sending like, <laughs> animals to our shit. <laughs> and, and I think that this movie also is clearly inspired by the Hollywood disaster movies. It feels like the property destruction, the airplane crashing. It feels like there's a citywide blackout at one point that kind of is a spooky thing, but it really feels like something that would happen in the movie Earthquake um, or the the towering infernal or, or something like that to me mm. the i don't know much about the main male actor other than that he uh actually trained animals at some point but the main adult actress lorraine de Selle, was a really big name in uh, italian exploitation movies at the time this would have been a slightly later in her career but she's uh in cattle ferrex and she plays evil prison wardess w- wardenesses in both violence and women's prison and the women's prison massacre. And she's menaced by David Hess in house on the edge of the park. And she's uncredited bit in Emmanuel in America. And what's funny is this was her, was is her last theatrical film. She's kept on working in TV, um, but she's thoroughly covered up the whole movie. And I, th- I feel like that was like her saying, yeah, I'll make one more movie, but I'm tired of being topless in every movie I'm in. Well, I feel so, like the exploitation in this movie wasn't... It wasn't I aimed mean, there. It, yeah, it's not It's not aimed at the people. It's aimed at the animals. At the animal part. Yeah, I mean, because she's dressed like... Like, she's got, even, got a high collar. She doesn't even have mm-hmm. any cleavage showing. Like, I, I feel like yeah, it must have been nice for her to just get to act. I'm sure that um, was nice, Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and then I guess my other thought is just the idea that this was released within months of Razorback is is sort of nuts to think we had this like hyper modern Australian movie and this throwback of a uh, of a this this movie that looked like it came out at least ten years before it did from Italy. Like it looks like a nineteen seventy four Italian horror. Movie. Yeah, and yeah, I that's think the it's... thing. When I watched it, I was like, "This looks older than it." Yeah, is probably. Like yeah, eighty four seems late for that, yeah. but yeah, it was that's crazy to me. But do you have any other thoughts on wild beasts, zoo uh, horror? The ending, the, the ending was in- insanely abrupt. <laughs> yeah, that's another thing you get used to watching a lot of Italian horror movies. Is it's just like, and then they ran out of money. The end. <laughs> <laughs> it's not uncommon. Yeah, it's and it's kind of it kind of ends on like kind of like a bummer, you know, because a lot of times these movies feel like resolved in one in one way or another. Even like even if there's a sad ending, like uh-huh. like with um Long Weekend, like the couple dies, like that that's a bummer note to end on. But like that's a kind of like I was like, but it's an ending, you know. Yeah. Um, and then Razorback is just like you know they kill the pig, that's an ending. And then this one is just like the children are crazy, and it's just like now what. You know, after you've said that, um, a lot of Italian, like, later stage zombie movies and the cannibal movies um, and some of their kind of version of slasher movies all also end abruptly with a open-ended thing or just a huge, just like everything sucks now kind of thing. Yeah. Like, 
like Fulci's zombie ends with zombies are now in New York at the end. And uh, uh, Anthropophagus ends with, and now he's eating his own intestines at the end. It's oh, just like, it's oh just cra- wacky shit like that. So it's not out of, it's not out of character for the, the period and the place to just sort of just end on a shocker. And, and like, I assume the audiences would always laugh at those things. I don't think the audiences would leave gasping. I think it would be like, oh, that's silly. I mean, I guess it's one of those endings where it's like made to make you think, especially in context of like the Mm -hmm. opening quote where it's just like, you know, we project things onto the innocent, you know, Mm -hmm. we turn innocent things into monsters. Yeah. Um, Yeah. With drugs and with violence and with expectations and all this stuff. And so it's just like, but people are not going to think that deeply about a movie like this, I don't think. Yeah. Well, and, and, and it's also a kind of a fun ending because I really like killer kid movies too. And the, the, <laughs> the 70s were also a great time for killer kid movies. So this is sort of like a throwback in that sense too. Yeah. It's like the old man and the bad seed and all that stuff. Yeah. Know? Oh my God. Uh, Who Can Kill a Child, the Spanish movie. That is a classic. <laughs> yeah it's really intense it's like sort of like the birds but with children oh good it is a way of putting it it's it's intense there's a bunch of rabid preschoolers <laughs> sort of i mean sort of it's like an island it's 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 an island uh of children that have killed all the adults and s- uh, english tourists come to the island to see hey we hear this is a great place to be oh my god oh my god <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I highly recommend that. We talk, uh, Patrick and I talked about it on our our scariest movie moments. There's a bit nice. in that that really freaks me out. Holy crap! Um, okay, so then let's move on. We were originally going to do five movies. We we deleted one. I didn't feel like watching it, and I felt like I liked the idea of them being in a shorter period from mm-hmm. like seventy eight to eighty nine here. So closing out the eighties and the podcast with uh, Food of the Gods Part Two or Gnaw Food of the Gods Part Two. Uh, oh, and and so this is a different brand of absolutely crazy batshit stuff. I, th- I feel like I tried to make these so they just got crazier as they went along. <laughs> it's not a serious movie. <laughs> no, no. I've read reviews that are like, oh, it's unintentionally funny. And I'm like, are you sure that was unintentional? This no, seems I think it was pretty intentional. intentionally funny like, to me. I think, I think that you're you're just thinking you're better than this movie, Mr. Critic, who saw, said it was unintentional. Like a man runs with his butt facing the camera and the camera is uh like down at butt level as if it was a giant rat and i'm like this yeah. is amazing it's like butt level steady cam <laughs> butt level steady cam and so they put funny. effort into that this is directed by damian lee and i've heard two things um the one i believe is that this was a killer rat movie that was retrofitted as an in on in name only sequel to the 1976 giant animal movie food of the gods which is itself based on an hg wells novel a different source claims that bert i gordon the director of food of the gods was originally planning this as a sequel and then lost interest and it changed it seems much more likely because they have nothing in common other than giant animals and this one's almost exclusively giant rats and there's more than just giant rats in food of the gods food of the gods is uh, i didn't make you watch it because it's just not necessary but mm-hmm. um it's what you would expect from a giant animal movie. Um, it's it's mostly family friendly. It's very B movie. It's kind of fun. It's super dated. Uh, it feels like more like it was made in the fifties instead of the seventies. And then the, my little funny side thing is that the director uh, Bert I Gordon, uh, his initials are B I G, so his nickname was Mister Big. Oh, nice. And but it was funny because he really specialized in movies that had big things. So he had. That he had Amazing Colossal Man. He made The Empire of the Ants. He made uh, Earth versus the Spider. Wow. And then he made Attack of the Puppet People, which is the opposite, where the people are little and everything else is big. Mm-hmm. And so he had this whole special effects thing that he did. They're silly movies. They're very different than this. They're silly on their own. They're very serious, but they're silly. They feel very, um, but he they had feel a like brand. you, yeah. And they feel like they, they all feel like you took 70s soap opera actors and stuck them in a monster movie they all have that kind of like like the cast of dallas wandered into a monster movie Mm. kind of vibe to them (laughs) that's cool yeah this one is just unhinged out of control from Uh, the jump it's sort of an attempt i think at bringing the sort of 50s giant monster and animal movies into the 80s and it has a lot of fashionable gore effects and stuff but it also you know by the late 80s there's a lot of comedy horror 
at this point. So they're also kind of going for that thing. And I think they just kept on, I've never read any real behind the scenes information on this. It's never been on Blu-ray. So I've never seen any making of material or commentary tracks or anything like that. I think that it was just sort of them throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what stuck. And they just had the wherewithal or they eat, maybe they just hired the right people so that it actually kind of fits together and works instead of just seeming like chaos. I mean, it was pretty chaotic. Like, um, yeah, I wonder if Controlled I should explain chaos. how when I when I started the movie, I used a file that Gabe sent me, and <laughs> I just hit play via like the Google Drive, and I'm watching this movie, and it's not in English. I'm like, uh oh, I'm like, I don't know what's happening here, and it's in Hindi. The, yeah. the track that I'm like, Gabe, this movie isn't in English, and he's like, I gave you the same one, and so he's like you know, download it. And then there's multiple tracks. And then when I did, I opened it and there was the Hindi track, which was the default for some reason. Yeah. And maybe what I got, since it's not on Blu-ray, maybe what I got was like a rip of the Indian DVD or yeah. something. But it <laughs> so had, had the Hindi, Hindi track was defaulted, then the English track. But I got like, it was like five minutes into the movie before I got to even put it together well no not even that i was like i immediately saw it. i was like i immediately it was just like this is not in english and i'm for some reason i just sat there and was like watching and then i got to a point where a ginormous child shows up <laughs> and i was like pause i was like i need context for this i was like <laughs> I was like, Gabe, something happened. <laughs> Can you help me? So then I had to start over. And he's like, you need to watch the that scene in English. So I start the movie over from the beginning just to get like proper context. And when it gets to the giant child cursing the scientist <laughs> out, I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> this giant kid is just like, get the fuck out. And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> It, it's it, the the context is great because it's the idea is a very confusing plot where there's there's like three different projects going on and one is to I can't remember one is to cure baldness one is to cure baldness but it's a front they're 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 saying that they're curing cancer but yeah they're, they're, they're saying they're curing, curing cancer baldness. and then um, there's this thing that this older scientist who is the uh, the the main character is a, her protege and she's created something and I can't remember what the purpose of that is but what it does is it makes children giant and irritable oh no she was like trying to cure like her grandsons or whatever um like he has like a, a growth disorder or something and she was trying to <laughs> cure it and then she made it worse. And then it made him and so, aggressive. And so they're like, it makes them big and aggressive. And they do this by this child walks out. And he's huge. He's massive. And, it's, his head and his, like clothes are, are, his clothes are don't fit him. His belly is like and sticking his, out. He says, I'd like you to meet Tommy or whatever his name is. And he he's goes, and Tommy. I'd like you to get the fuck out of my room. <laughs> and I'm like, what is this? And this is five minutes into the movie. Like, and it's like the rest of the movie. Minutes almost lives up to that like that scene is, <laughs> is so because, funny but the thing is like it's like the movie's so normal up to this point it's just like <laughs> here's like you know there's like college students protesting outside and here's scientists doing stuff yeah. that's a little bit shady and then this guy he goes visits this old lady and because you know i guess they used to work together and she's like i want you to meet my grandson and this giant there's no warning comes out and i'm like what is the this? first words in his mouth i get the fuck out of here <laughs> it is yeah. genuinely the funniest thing i've seen in like a you almost long, don't long actually time. have to watch the rest of the movie after that i recommend <laughs> it but <laughs> I'm sure that clip is on YouTube somewhere. If that's all you I th really I want. Think, I think Gabe is right. Where it's just like nothing else in that movie lives up to it, and the movie, <laughs> the rest of the movie is very silly. But it's just like that. That was like the last thing I expected because I was just like, oh, this is a killer animal movie, and then I yeah. see a giant child cursing <laughs> out an adult, and I was like, um, what? <laughs> And then, but then, like, there's other things, like the dream sequence. Okay, well, well, yeah. So, 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 wait. The plot I know, I'm is, jumping is ahead. Yeah, there are these, the there are these plot. dueling things, and the guy is sort of being convinced. He's trying to continue his, trying to save the giant baby, <laughs> the giant child, <laughs> the people who share the, 
this the place with them are doing this cure for baldness and they're mixing the two and then person he works for sees this growth hormone he's like oh we could cure world hunger with this which is something you always do in movies like the way to kill cure world hunger is to make giant food is always the way they solve world hunger in science fiction movies it's the stupidest shit because you just end up with a giant bunch of giant spoiled food it's not oh gonna work God, it's not it's but, so dumb but the things just keep on getting out of control and uh <laughs> and eventually uh the, the the rats get into it and then giant rats happen and they escape and they attack the town and that's sort and of the rats the, are confusingly like inconsistent in size yes yeah they did like it's just like i was like okay they're all giant but some of them are like the size of like a dog, like a small dog, and some of them are like a freaking wolf. Yeah, and, like... and they don't have great composite effects, but they have some really fun, uh, like rat head puppets when the rats yes. are attacking people that are just like super awesome, like angry looking rat faces. But they didn't really make them look like monsters, which I think is a really nice. No, touch. they just look like rats. They're kind of cute when they're actual real rats. They're yeah. just like, because because um, there's this thing that I always notice in movies is if you've ever been around rats, rats are really fastidious in cleaning themselves, like pet rats. Mm. Um, I imagine sewer rats don't give a shit. But um, <laughs> the only rats with with red eyes are are albinos. They're white, but the white mice don't look, or rats don't look scary, so they always paint them in movies. So you'll see gray or black rats with red eyes. And then if you I know this. <laughs> you'll notice that there's always shots of rats trying desperately to clean the paint off of their fur. Oh my God. You always, in all sorts of movies, as soon as you notice it once, you see all throughout movies, it's just footage of rats going, what the fuck? What is this? I was like, this? get the shit off of me. <laughs> and so they, there's plenty I was of, like, I'm trying to do my skincare. <laughs> yeah, basically. And they're like, why did I get painted? I don't understand. <laughs> It's so, it's so like, yeah, it's rest. And then, but then like the best touch is other than the giant child is that there's a good rat too, like a gizmo, I guess. <laughs> um, who's a white rat, a regular white rat. But it's like the guy is abnormally attached to this rat. He had like, no, he like barely likes his girlfriend. He likes but he loves, rat. <laughs> he loves this rat. And there's not much reason for it. It's a cute rat. Oh, and the freaking it, like Pied Piper shit. I was yeah. Like, and, and, and there's this whole, yeah, unexplored basically thing where he trains it with a pipe with a pipe as a Pied Piper thing that you think is gonna be very and important the later. Plays three blind mice. I'm like, hello. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. And way later in the movie, the the good rat accidentally gets big, <laughs> and he uses it to, to call her back. And there's there's actually a really good scene toward uh, the climax is that rats sort of crash a. Um, a synchronized swimming meet, which is another cue that this is supposed to be funny. You don't have giant rats attack a synchronized swimming meet if you're they not like trying to be funny. They come out of the water and like attack the entire like stadium of, of people sitting in, like these high school bleachers. Yes, and it is pandemonium. People are like jumping over each other. They fly down the stairs. And, like... It's like everybody thought they were a stunt person in that moment. <laughs> And it's surprisingly graphically violent. It, is, um, it goes on forever, too. But there is a cute bit where the white rat doesn't want to have... You think that she's going to, like, solve the situation? Because they send her in, but she just hides under the bleachers. Yeah. And then there's a little girl who's freaked out until she sees the white rat. And you're like, oh, the white rat's going to gonna protect the little girl. Not really. The white rat just sort of hangs out also, with the, the little, little girl. the little kid is not a good actor. They don't look freaked out at all. They're just kind of no. like smiling at the camera. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, the, the one bad choice the movie makes is it kills the nice rat while the other rats are getting mowed down. Because there's this like sort of moment where the rats are getting mowed down. The guy's like, no. And this is wrong, but it's really this. He wants to save his favorite rat. Um, it's sort of like, well, come on, man. It's, I wanted the big rat to survive and just be a good girl because she doesn't get aggressive because she's so nice. She's yeah. just such a good rat. She's she doesn't get aggressive. Rat. Yeah. You know, that's, that's not a that... commentary on anything. No, not at all. Not like the gray rats. <laughs> uh. Um, I do. I, I was like shocked by how absurdly violent this movie was. I mean, it was like violent in a funny way, but also kind of like I was like ill because like when the animal activists get killed, I was like, like I knew it yeah. was going to be like crazy. Like I was like, yeah, these killer rats are going to kill people. But I was like, 
um, this man gets his eyeballs eaten out, and yes, it's crazy. <laughs> and then there's like crunching noises. These these movies have so many crunching noises, and I'm like, Ugh. I was like, who is the foley <sighs> artist behind this? Like, what are they doing? Ugh. It's crazy, um, but it's also like very funny at the same time because it's so over the top. And then, like, to make it even crazier, the bad scientist trying to cure baldness ends up basically melting himself. It um, turns he, like, into freaking curdled milk. <laughs> yeah, it just turns into goo. And my assumption, again, I don't have a lot of information on this one. My assumption is that uh, they had hired special effects guy and some special effects guy says, hey, look at this thing I can do. And they're like, oh, that's great. Add that. Let's do that. Let's, let's put it in. <laughs> let's put let's add it. Let's put that in the movie. Now wait, was this the movie where you said you wanted me to not look up the director? No, that was that was Russell Mul- Mul- uh that was the last two actually. I didn't want you to know Russell Mulcahy he was a music video guy and I didn't want you to learn that uh that the Wild Beasts director uh was possibly complicit in war crimes. <laughs> <laughs> no, this guy's just a guy. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> this guy's just a guy having fun. Uh Yeah, I mean, I learned about this. I had a when I was in college, I bought a book called the Splatter Movie Book that was just like little capsule reviews of movies that the guy who coined the term Splatter Movie considered Splatter Movies. And so I just would keep it in the car when I go to rental stores and be like, oh, you know, I want to see Splatter Movies. And I was like, why is Food of the Gods 2 but not 1 in this book? And so that made me very curious. And so that's, that's the first the thing, time I saw yeah. it many years ago. It's and a splatter asked, I was like, movie. Do I need to see the first one to understand? Nah. So you're like, no, literally no. No, <laughs> no the first they one just, is they just, just a used normal. used a name to capitalize, I guess. on like To capitalize on a movie that was already 10 years old at mm. that point. The biggest laugh is the kid. But the second biggest laugh is the sex stream. <laughs> oh, my God. I, I, I was like, what's happening? Um, and- it's funny, too, because it's not even his girlfriend. It's just like a random co-ed. The, that he has a sex dream about and in the dream he self doses his formula uh and grows huge having sex the random co-ed character and it's like the funniest thing like just like the the the, the cut and he's just like he's just like this giant he has these giant it's like the giant prop hand yeah and it's this hilarious this prop hand woman it's just yeah like, <laughs> and and my guess is that the actress who plays his girlfriend lisa schreig uh, just said, I, I'm not going to do that. And so they're like, they just wrote it in that it would just be a random girl from an earlier scene. <laughs> I'm not going to, I'm not going to sit nude on top of the fake tomatoes, this fake giant tomatoes and sit there while you figure out camera angles to make this giant hand look big. It's, <laughs> it's just so not crazy. And they no used the hand you. more than once. Yeah. And then, yeah, that's the big, it's a to be continued ending because the, the, the boy escapes. Um, he beats up his grandma and escapes into the night. So it's like, I don't know, maybe maybe there would have been an uh, amazing col- Colossal Beast remake as the sequel. It'd just be a giant angry boy. I think it has more in common with Jaws than Razorback too, because it has a stupid mayor, but he, instead he's a stupid dean of the college. He's trying yes. to cover up the racket, rat attacks because oh it would God. be bad for the school. The wealthy alumni won't donate money anymore. <laughs> he's like He's uh, like mad about all the experiments that they're running. It, it, yeah, I think for for it does have some tone deaf scenes that I don't think are supposed to be funny, but it's just so much of it is so so dopey, uh, and and so silly that it's like it's almost like a Naked Gun movie at some points. At some points, yeah, and it's just, but it's also like as dopey as it is, it's also really sincere because they're like they're really trying. Yeah, they're trying so yeah. hard. <laughs> and it's just like one of those things where like um, I'm not the type of person to, to rail against CG. I think CG is a tool and it can be good or bad. It's not a good thing or a bad thing. But there is something about cheap CG is just not interesting to look at in the same way that cheap physical effects are fun to look at. Uh, so so a lot of this movie is even when this effects aren't very convincing, they're just really charming and silly, really funny trick photography with miniature sets of regular rats running along clear what is clearly uh you know miniature versions of all the sets it's it's very obvious giant baby and of course the giant hand that they use twice (laughs) yes (laughs) because they spent money on that sucker Mm -hmm. um yeah, and in the end you said something about it and I said yeah I hope someone kept that hand I, I I imagine that the the rubber it's made out of is rotted by now but you know I don't know someone should have kept it I don't know how big exactly it was, but it somebody was pretty has large. those rats somewhere in storage. 
Yeah, that's just the way it is. This was made in Canada, but I wanted to note that it was co-distributed in the U.S. by Corolco, and this would have been the year after Rambo 3 was a massive, one of the biggest hits of the year, and the year before Total Recall was one of the biggest hits of the year. The idea that the same studio put this out on video in between those two massive hits was very funny to me. <laughs> kind of just shows you the breadth of their catalog at the time, I guess. Just the way movies were weird in the late 80s. I don't think there was very much animal cruelty. Uh, I think that do poor dog was very uncomfortable. It had a prosthetic head wound. So it probably didn't enjoy itself. Yeah, but, um, I, think, I, think I don't think it was being tortured. Can, it didn't really, I mean, there was real rats, but. Yeah, they weren't, they weren't having a good time, but they didn't, yeah, there's like a scene where it keeps falling into the water and I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure there's just a stage hand just sort of shoving the rat back in the water <laughs> off camera. Yeah, but I don't think there's a lot of like actual, like, like mortal so, danger yeah. that the rats were in. I, I looked, yeah, direct, Damien Lee, he directed four movies and they all had a certain amount of, of. Uh, cult uh, appeal to them. He did this raunchy comedy called Ski School, which was like this late ripoff of of the short lived raunchy ski movies. <laughs> like those eight, he, like the like the ski resort. Yeah, and like Hot Dog was one of them. Uh, that was probably the first one. Uh, he did a movie called Last Man Standing about an underground fight ring. And then he did Abraxas, The Guardian of the Universe, which is this really ambitious, low-budget sci-fi movie, famously starring former Minnesota governor Jesse Ventura as the title character. Nice. <laughs> it's, it's like the end of an era, it feels like. It feels like it, it was like past its prime at this point, and this is just something that came out. But like I said, it's not on Blu-ray for some reason, and I'm sure there's a weird rights issue with it using the Food of the Gods name. It wasn't allowed to be released or something but it would be it, it's the kind of thing that i really do wish one of these boutique labels would get the rights to and like put out a nice disc with like interviews assuming any of the people are still alive so we could just learn about how ridiculous this ridiculous silly thing that kind of is, is still under the radar like you don't hear a lot of people talking about no Naw. it doesn't have like um, a how did this get made yeah episode. and it feels like it could it really should have how did this get made <laughs> I mean, if people care about Ben and Willard, I, they should care about about Naw. I guess there's no Michael Jackson theme song. It no, makes a difference. This is also um, the third of the f all, three of the four of these movies have animals create uh, fatal car accidents, <laughs> and this one has it happened twice. So that's like almost the theme here. There's, there isn't there isn't a fatal car accident in Razorback. There's like near. There's like a scene where a bunch of people are rushing out and they're maybe rushing a little too fast. Well, but, I mean, uh, the pig eats through the car, so. That's true. That's true. He doesn't force a car accident. But that's no. funny how that's that's how the, that's what all the screenwriters are like. And I think then the animals cause a car accident and a bunch of people <laughs> die. But yeah, that's all I got um, for <laughs> for these silly movies. Do you have any other thoughts on uh, Food of the... Oh, oh, God. And I should say that there's also a bit where the kid... We go back to the kid, oh and he says, God. "I hate you," and spits in the lady's face. The the stuff they do with the kid is just like the most aggressive. It's like stuff. so weird, and it's so unnecessary to the rest of the movie. It's like its own little thing. It's very like kind of like I was like I was like, are they gonna go back to the kid? And, you're like, and yeah, and like, they okay. did, <laughs> but it's like to be continued. And then the ending, it's... where he just like he kills his grandma, and he busts yeah. through the door like freaking the Kool Aid Man. And yeah, that's the, that's the end of the movie. I'm like, oh, yeah, it's to be continued. Well, Got to hunt down the giant angry child now, uh, like King Kong. <laughs> so crazy, so dumb. I love it. <laughs> Good times. Yeah. Any other thoughts on any of these I, before I'm we gonna, sign off? I'm gonna be stuck on Giant Baby for a good while. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> Should find a screen cap, turn it into like all my social media uh headers and and stuff and people ask what is that and i'll say oh it's the greatest movie ever made tyler it's the greatest a, scene tyler makes a geb <laughs> shark in like tiny clothes in tiny clothes yeah yeah get the fuck out of here <laughs> i should just see if the, I, i'll look for the clip online and i'll post it <laughs> so all, all of our mutual friends will know what we're talking about yes i'm sure someone added it to youtube oh yeah <laughs> so uh are you still doing the other podcast i i, I forget 
I sure are am. You? Okay, mm-hmm. well, tell people where they can find you. Um, if you're interested in hearing more of my thoughts on pop culture and the like, uh, listen to Not All Podcasts Wear Capes. I do it uh, with my my good buddies, T and Spade. We don't really have a set release schedule. We just kind of like record when we can, release when we can, but it's always a good time with us. Uh, we're going to record on Dune very shortly. I was going to ask because I saw that you saw the second one. I haven't watched the second one yet. We just. Oh, you watched the we... first one tonight, right? Yeah, I rewatched the first one tonight. I'll nice. go sometime during the week. Nice. <clears throat> Watch the new one. Well, you can find me as usual on the Shadow Grinder website, the Shadow Grinder Facebook page. I'm on Blue Sky as Gabe Powers. Um, I still have a Genre Grinder Twitter. I only use it to post reviews and uh, links to the podcast. I'm not really using it for anything else at this point. Um, then, then there's Genre Grinder Gabe on Instagram. Until next time, remember to uh, please spay and neuter your pets. And uh, I'll talk to you later. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Bye.